You may remember a few weeks uh, back, um, we had a fascinating chat, and we talked a bit of Gorilla. Well, I didn't, but one of our guests talked a bit of Gorilla. Um, and he's Beverly born, lived in Hull. He introduced Sir David Attenborough to Gorillas in Africa. And uh, he, along with uh, a couple of uh, Hull um, conservationists, a couple of other local lads, were going to climb Kilimanjaro. His name is Ian Redmond, uh, and we're going to talk to him. We're also going to talk to Andrew Steele. Uh, and they're in various parts of the globe. Uh, let's go to the, the least exotic place, because Ian Redmond, I think, is in a studio in Gloucester. Morning, Ian. Am I right? Yes, good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, lovely to talk to you. Remind us why um, you were trekking up Kilimanjaro. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the climb was to draw attention to climate change, um, so we, we called it Climb for Climate Action, and we made a documentary on the way up. Right. Because, uh, Kilimanjaro is, is sort of f famous snowy summit that appears as a backdrop to some of the most iconic photographs of elephants and other African wildlife. Um, it's, it's increasingly lacking the snow. Uh, the, it does snow up there. We saw snow while we were up there, but it melts very quickly. And the glaciers, which were a feature of the top of... Uh, Kilimanjaro have, dis uh, have reduced by about 80% in the, in the past century and this, the predictions are that they'll be gone within the next decade or two um, so it's a very visible sign of, of climate change and we feel I think that uh, individuals need to do more to wake up to this what's happening and we certainly need to be pressuring our governments to stop puffing about and, and take decisive action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and, and stabilise the climate because the cost of doing nothing is going to be far greater than the cost of doing something. I, I, I'm going to come back to you on that. You know, I've written down the phrase, governments are faffing about, but um, <laughs> you, 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 your <laughs> colleagues, uh, who also have strong local connections, two whole lads, uh, we're going to talk to Andrew Steele, uh, and we're also uh, going to talk... Uh, to Ian Singleton. Uh, Ian is, in, I think, in somewhere a, a bit more exotic than Gloucester. Ian, morning to you. Where are you? Uh, I'm in freezing cold, drizzly and miserable Auckland right now. Right, in uh, right, in, in, in New Zealand, yes? Uh, yeah, but it's cold. It's middle of winter. Right, OK. Well, we're feeling your pain. We're, we're, <laughs> we're feeling your pain <laughs> this morning. Very much. Does it? <laughs> New Zealand very similar to Hull. I mean, it's not a place I've ever been, actually. It's, it's meant to be absolutely beautiful, isn't it? Uh, it is special. I think the, the, the really important, the special thing about New Zealand is just the lack of people, the very low density of people. But it's a very green area where, um, amazingly, the weather is very, very similar to Hull on a, on a miserable November or December day right now. Uh, and, and does New Zealand get affected by climate change? What are they seeing in New Zealand? Uh, to be honest, I, I've never really discussed it at length with them, and I only flew in yesterday morning, and I fly out uh, at the end of tomorrow. But um, I imagine yes, and uh, a, a lot of the major cities are on the coast, and if their sea levels rise, they're going to have big negative impacts, yes. Uh, I'll, I will come back to We're also going to talk to Andrew Steele, who I think I'm right in saying is also a whole lad. Andrew, which exotic um, part of the, uh, the world are you in this morning? I'm coming to you from a hot and steamy Bangkok. All right, we, we, we're getting four seasons in, in, in ten minutes here. Uh, I, should, I, I feel bad now because I've not asked Ian what the weather's like in Gloucester. What's the weather like in Gloucester, Ian? It's very nice. I, I cycled in from Stroud to Gloucester this morning um, and it was lovely. Right. Sunny but cool. Uh, Andrew, what, what were you doing as, as part of this trek up Kilimanjaro? What, what was your part in it? Um, I think I was the one that was responsible for bringing the other two guys together and saying, let's, as a whole contingent, let's do something about climate change and support our own respective organisation. OK, and we're also, we've got a fourth member of our little discussion group this morning. Abby Barnes was involved in, in this. Uh, which exotic location are you in, Abby? Morning. I'm on the train on the way down to Cornwall, actually, so if I disappear, the signal goes. Right, OK, because uh, you, you filmed it. Uh, am I correct in this? Yeah, yeah, my role was a filmmaker. Um, we had a lot of technical issues, but managed to get around it with the guys' help, so it was a great adventure. <laughs> OK, uh, and where will people be able to see the film, Abby? I'll, I'll keep it short, because you're on a train and you will go in a tunnel or we'll lose yeah. the sig signal. <laughs> well, um, my role, I've got to put together a trailer, um, and that will more than likely be online, so people can check that out. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I guess, um, it, it's the main film, which will be put together by myself, and then go across to Andy 
and he's, I think, going to try and get it out to a broadcasting company or something. So that would be really good. And then from there, obviously, we'll, we'll do announcements wherever it goes. All right. Uh, Abby, I'll let you go, because it is really a dodgy line, and okay, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll chat to the chaps. So thank you very much for that. Andy, wh who are you hoping, which broadcaster are you hoping, or broadcasters might take this film on? Uh, we've had preliminary discussions with Discovery Channel in Singapore, but we're open to any networks that are willing to promote what we've done mm. in our work. And, and when will the film be ready? I think that's down to Abby, really. She's got a lot of work to do filming the amazing footage that we've got climbing Kilimanjaro. And she's intending to put three 27-minute documentaries together. So I think the end of the year, really. Right, OK. And, and what was the experience for you like? And I'm going to come back to the two Ians in a bit, because, again, it's a better line. Um, I'm, I've got to honestly say it is amazing, emotional, but also one of the toughest things I've ever done. OK. What was so tough about it? Physically, the, uh, the first five days were, were pretty steady, uh, an average climb, but the, the summit day after really no sleep and then climbing for six hours, spending time at the top, then another three hours down and a 90-minute rest and then another four-hour trek to the next camp. That was physically demanding. OK. Andy, I'm going to let you go as well, because it, it, it's on the phone and um, I'll, I'll talk to the other two chaps where the quality aligns a little better. Don't no, be offended. No, nice to talk to you. Is there any... Thank you for that. Um, let's, let's go back uh, to Ian Redmond. You said governments are faffing about on climate change. Is that because they don't understand it? I don't think it's a case of not understanding it. I think it's a case of um, economic pressures and political pressures. Uh, but every year when the United Nations um, Climate Convention meets and they, they assess the latest assessment, um, it seems that the, uh, the predictions are getting worse. The things that they're predicting a few years ago might happen in decades are happening now, and a lot of the change is happening faster than anticipated. So it, it's, people talk about reaching tipping points, uh, and the tipping points that we're reaching will mean that it accelerates rather than slows down. So that the window opportunity for taking decisive action is, is closing. So it, we're going to have a lot more extreme weather events, a lot more um, floods and torrential downpours and, uh, as Ian mentioned, rising sea levels. Uh, once that starts to kick in, then all the cities that live on, on the coast at, at close to sea level are going to have to put money into flood defences or relocate, depending on the, the level of rise. But it, it's it's something which... We certainly want governments to take action on, but every individual has to take action, and that's what we felt we could do by doing something. It took us out of our comfort zone, as Andy just intimated. It was quite a tough slog to get to 19,340 feet. Um, and, you know, the 19,300 is all right. It's the last 40 feet. That's <laughs> <a difficult. laughs> um, but we did that as, a, as a, an exercise of pushing ourselves beyond our comfort zone and also to see firsthand this evidence of, of disappearing glaciers. And it is stunningly beautiful up there, but when the glaciers have gone, it'll be less beautiful and, and it will be a very visible sign of what's happening globally. But for the people who live around Kilimanjaro, their year-round water supply, which during the dry season comes from glacier-fed streams, is going to dry up. Mm. So that's just one example of, of the trouble, not very far down the line, if we, if we can't turn this around. Um, so we, we were each raising money for charities which are involved in efforts to combat climate change, sometimes by protecting wildlife, in particular tropical forests. And uh, Tothery will talk about uh, the importance of orangutan habitat in, in the fight against dangerous climate change, I'm sure. Um, Ian, the, the, the climate change debate... Uh, and it is a debate because not everybody accepts it. I think it's probably fair. I think to it's gone beyond debate. I, I think we've got 99% of, of climate scientists saying X and a, a tiny percentage saying Y. I think we have to go with X. Um, and much as it might be nice to think that there's still some debate, uh, the evidence is stacking up year after year. It's not a debate. OK, l let me ask Ian Singleton. As you, uh, Ian uh, Redmond said, as individuals we have to do things. What can we do as individuals, Ian Singleton? 
Well, I think that there's, you know, as, as as an individual, we all vary, yeah, and we all vary in our ability to do things, and we all vary in our motivation to do things. But I think what people have to understand is that we are, you know, the the battle. What traditionally is a, a sort of fight to save a few endangered species from going extinct has, has turned into something much more important. And um, I'm in Auckland right now, and I've just come from a big primate conference where people are saying, you know, what what does it matter if orangutans go extinct? But the vast majority of orangutans are living in in peat swamp forests, and peat peat swamps are basically carbon stores. I mean, there's a lot of carbon stored in the trees above ground and in the wildlife, but there's a lot more stored below ground in the peat, which is essentially uh, twigs and leaves and branches and trees and animals that have fallen in the water and haven't decomposed. But in Indonesia, the 56% of the tropical peatlands in the world are in Indonesia, and the, the peat experts will tell you that the amount of carbon locked up in these areas is between four and 16 times what is in the atmosphere today. So if we lose the orangutans because we've lost the forest, then we have a serious problem because, you know, the, the, the amount of carbon released to the atmosphere in that process is going to be devastating. It's a massive driver. Indonesia is number three in, in the world in terms of carbon emissions. They get behind China and the U.S., whose emissions are all from fossil fuel burning. But Indonesia, it, it's, it's all from destruction and burning of forests and peatlands. So the fight to save the orangutans is the same as the fight for climate change. And I think everybody has to realise that these issues are global issues now and that everybody has a role to play. And I, I want to bring this back locally because we've talked about this a couple of times on the, uh, on the show and I, I think that I've sort of weighed into the debate. I'm just going to bring it back. On, on the south bank of the river there are some black-tailed godwits uh, on the south bank of the river Humber, which you'll both be familiar with being local lads. And um, Able UK want to build a marine facility that's going to create, hopefully, lead to 10,000 jobs in the area. So far, they've spent, we think, 60 million quid um, on, on, on trying to move the site for the black-tailed godwits to the north bank of the river. 60 million quid. And part of me has said on this programme, well, well, a lot of me has said on this programme, you know, why are we spending this money on the black-tailed godwits when there's 10,000 jobs? Shouldn't human beings be more important in this equation? What, what would the two of you say about it? Ian Redmond first. Uh, I don't know the details of that particular yeah. case. But it's, but um, it's in the but, same but sort of sphere, really. It's, it's about... Well, the, the black-tailed godwits are probably what you might call a, a, a flagship species for that habitat. Mm -hmm. And whatever other um, ecosystem services that habitat provides, it, it'll be, if it's under concrete, you've lost them. And what there probably hasn't been, uh, but I don't know, perhaps there has, yeah. uh, is, is a, a, an economic assessment of the ecological cost of that development. So I don't know if there's another site nearby which would be equally good that doesn't... Well, they're, well, they're hoping to move them to the north bank of the river. The, the point I'm trying to make is, that are we getting the, the balance right between humans and animals in, 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 in what we're doing? But, but what Ian was um, pointing out is that it, it's beyond saving this or that species. We're trying to keep functioning ecosystems because all of our economic activities are based on, on there being a, a natural world that keeps the air fresh and the water pure and in which we live. And at the moment, I mean, the, the, the other big news story this morning on, on the radio was that, that a new study is out on African elephant numbers and, and something like 100,000 elephants have been killed by poachers in the last three years and people think, oh, that's terrible, the suffering of those elephants and, and the orphaned elephants um, mm -hmm. left without parents, all that, is, it's true. But elephants are central to the ecology of Africa. Those forests and savannas that we like to see in the documentaries or a few of us might get lucky enough and go and see on holiday are not just ornamental, they're what drives the weather, they're what stabilises the climate. So the loss of huge numbers of elephants and, and possible extinction of elephants is not just, oh, what a shame we've lost the elephants, but, oh, what a shame we've lost the mega gardeners that tend the forests, that, that recycle the nutrients, that disperse the seeds. And so orangutans and elephants and these other large animals, people are hooked up on the fact that they're either beautiful or they share some DNA with us and therefore we think they're really interesting. All that's true. But look at what they do, what have they evolved to do. So in the case of the black-tailed godwits, you know, the role they play in the ecosystem locally might be considered not very important. But if you look at what the whole ecosystem does for the surrounding area and 
and perhaps on a global scale, if, if it involves peat or if it involves um, some processes that, that are of global significance, that's what doesn't get factored into the economic equation. Of course jobs are important, but jobs where there isn't a, a functioning ecosystem that provides us with the air we breathe and the water we drink, Ain't much good. We, mm. we need both. <laughs> oh, where, where can people sort of check out the work that the pair of you are doing? Where's, where's the best place to go and see the, the, the stuff that you focus on? Uh, um, well, the, we'll, we'll go Ian Singleton first. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, most of my work is in Indonesia, working to, on Sumatran orangutan conservation, and the best place to find out what I'm up to is, is on www.sumatranorangutan.org. Uh, just look for Ian Singleton on Facebook and click on the guy with a picture of an orangutan in his in his photo, and uh, and you'll find a lot of information on there. Lovely to talk to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Ian Redman. Where's the best place to catch up on your work? Um, well, the April Lions for Apes dot com. Um, for, on the elephants, there's a website run by the Born Free Foundation that's simply called bloodyivory.org, and you can find out the devastating news on elephants at bloodyivory.org but all, all the climbers of Kilimanjaro I still have their Just Giving pages open mm -hmm. so if anybody wants to chip in and, and help us do this work then please go to the Just Giving page for Climb for Change and uh, you'll find uh, a reference to that on on all of our um, Facebook pages and Twitter accounts um, the April Alliance is 4 apescom and I tweet as at 4 apes and there's lots of links on recent tweets that would encourage you to find out more about this because uh, you, you say keeping it local in terms of climate there is no local we go shopping in a supermarket in all and we buy stuff full of palm oil shampoos or ice creams or biscuits or noodles and and we are paying for the destruction of those forests that Ian Singleton is trying to protect in Indonesia so it's our money that's doing it and we have to be more careful with our money and we have to have better legislation to require the manufacturers to only buy non-destructive palm oil because the deforestation hasn't gone away it just seems to be getting worse and, and we need to really push for stronger legislation and take individual action to make sure that it's not our money that's paying for it Appreciate your time this morning, Ian. Thank you very much um, for an enlightening discussion. Appreciate that. We'll see what people think this morning. Uh, there you go. Ian Redman, Beverly Bourne, uh, lived in Hull. And um, we didn't even, because, uh, you know, talk grillers with him. He was the man who introduced Sir David Attenborough to grillers. Last time we talked to Ian, we, he talked a bit of grillers for us. But, you know, I, I think maybe the bigger discussion uh, was the one worth having this morning.